Hello and welcome to the Best Seller Experiment, where we continue to discover what makes a bestseller and inspire you to start, finish and publish your book. I'm Mark DeVoe. And I am Mark Stay. And as always, the hugest of thank yous to our sponsors on the Bestseller Academy and our patrons over on Patreon. We simply could not keep this show going without you. Now, if you're interested in the Academy, you get me and Mr. D as your coaches. You get a wonderful community and community, something we're going to be talking about today on the podcast. Pop over to academy.bestsellerexperiment.com and find out more there. And if you're interested in supporting us on Patreon, all sorts of extra stuff on there, deep dives. You get all these on the Academy as well, by the way. Just thought I'd mention that. Deep dives, extraordinary stuff. We've got a new deep dive coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, Mr. Ian W. Sainsbury, award winner, Kindle story at Storyteller Award winning uh, author uh, Ian W. Sainsbury. We're doing a deep dive looking into his editing process. I've just Ooh. recorded it. It's over an hour long. It gets Priceless. really forensic. It's is it, absolutely. If you want to learn how to edit with a best selling award winning author, come and join us on Patreon. Fantastic. Mr. Stay, talking to Patreon, I, we talked a few weeks ago, didn't we, about. Um Shannon Mayer, who was doing a oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kickstarter, Kickstarter, which is a crowdfunding, similar kind of thing to Patreon. And she was doing, um, I think, very much inspired by the the insanity of Brandon Sanderson's most recent yeah. Kickstarter, which hit $41 million. <laughs> still can't, I looked at it the other day and I was just thinking to myself, what? How like he he wanted to raise a million dollars? That was you know kickstart. You put a target, and you have mm. you know. I mean, you know this very well. You've done this for your. I've for your done, a million. <laughs> done a million. Right, <laughs> I did yeah, five yeah. grand, mate, and that took me. No, ages. no, but you've done the you've, you've done the goal setting. <laughs> I know we can all dream, right? I mean, Brandon Sanson, right? He 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 wanted to raise one million, and he ended up with forty one million. And I was just I've just been kind of delving into it. I think we should probably do a deep dive on on dissecting what happened there. But the wonderful mm. Shannon Mayer has kind of followed in his footsteps and she she released these hardback books which she put up for crowdfunding like beautiful hardback books of these series with tons of different options that you can get and she did this really great thing where she kind of included this pack of tarot cards which were yes. themed through her her books that she mm. did and they were beautifully designed and um you know this is Shannon's like an independent indie author doing this with herself and a little team there um, and she raised 350,000. I mean, obviously, look at 41 million, but 350,000 from one as an indie author. Absolutely brilliant. So, congratulations to Shannon. And it just shows what's possible. Like, just thinking outside the box a bit, you know, um, what you can tie in with your books. I think it's, I think it's the future, Mark. I think this is how authors are going to make their money. I really do. Yeah, very possibly. I did um I did my reader server, got my results back. And Ooh. one of the things I was asking about was merch, merchandising and and stuff like that and what people would like. So I have got an idea of the kind of goodies that that readers of the Witches of Woodville books would like. And it's it's really, you know, really eye opening and it it's got little cogs turning in my head. I'm certainly not at Shannon's level yet. Um but you know, it's uh it's definitely something that I'm I'm considering, you know. But it's well, um We've been asked so many times, and I'd say not even asked, I think we say badgered and harassed, <laughs> right? I think <laughs> they're merch. Yeah, badgered yeah, yeah. to do yeah. merch for the bestseller experiment. And I think, actually, we've been going five years now. We've never we've never done even a mug or something. So, no. okay, folks, we're going to put it out there. We, we want to see if there's a demand. If you want us to do merch... Come on, you know, send us a, a, a message on Twitter and say, yeah, we want we want bestseller experiment, experiment merch. And uh, what, what what should they hashtag it? Hashtag BXP merch, merch. something like that. Yeah. If yeah, we yeah. get an overwhelming demand, then we might look into it and we'll, we might have some fun with it. But uh, it's a lot of work, isn't it, Mark? I mean, on top of everything else. But uh, maybe if, if the demand is there, maybe we should maybe we should get the t shirts ready. Well, we say we say it's a lot of work. I don't think we've ever really tried it properly. I, I've, spoke, <laughs> I've spoken to a couple of podcasters, and they've they've given me some advice. But it is just just that thing of pulling my thumb out my backside and getting on with it. Um, but yeah, yeah, we should we should do it. We should give it a go. We should have a play with it. I think yeah, maybe yeah. maybe yeah. in the in maybe purely in the spirit of experimenting, <laughs> because I don't think a lot of authors do much uh, in the big scheme of things. I know a lot of the kind of um, you know popular and maybe you know. Authors, fancy authors love that kind of stuff as well. But maybe, yeah, maybe we're looking to say, if you would like bestseller experiment merch, let us know. And God forbid, I mean, if, if you will start asking us for it, then we might have to deliver. But anyway, yeah. Um, what else is new, Mark, this week? 
So yes, yeah, survey results. Um, I, I sent out a reader survey. Now, surveys, you know, they come with all the usual caveats. This is, you know, just a small sample of the millions of people who read my books. So, but, you know, but it's better than guesswork. So it was interesting getting the results back. So I, I got the results back, collated it, went through it, fine tooth comb kind of thing. I did a little um, slideshow for my publisher, which I sent to them showing them the results. And it was it was fascinating because... Um, Things, little assumptions you make, some are true, some are surprising. So uh, you remember um, Simon McCleave last week was saying that uh, 70% of his books sold were were paperbacks. Well, for me, it's 60-40. So 60% paperbacks to digital, 40% for digital, and that includes audio uh, as mm. well. Um, my readers are 60-40 female to male with 1% sort of transgender in there as well. Right. So uh predominantly more more female readers. Now what's what's really interesting is uh certainly when we pitched the book to publishers and conversations with Simon Schuster, there was kind of, oh, this is a bookshop book. This is a book you'll go into bookshops, you'll see it on the shelves, you'll pick it up. But sixty percent of sales come from Amazon. Hmm. Uh so you know uh, Amazon, you know, uh, whether it's one of those things where it's kind of tipped over um, and Amazon, uh, I've seen it's done well and decided to sort of come in and vacuum. Although, interestingly, that goes down a bit with book two. Book two, it's about 52% Amazon. Interesting, though, Mark. Half just and half. Ever the statistician, I always I always like to kind of question some of these. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But an interesting thing to consider um, is when you do an email survey, you're reaching out to people who are online, online obviously online. Yes. Um, yeah. And I, I bet you it's probably slight. You probably need to build in a, a bit of a variance of a couple of percent because I yep. bet you there's That's a lot true. of people that bought it in the bookstore that maybe aren't on the mailing list. I always, I always, I mean, I, but I mean, having those figures is absolutely brilliant. But well, yeah, we it, have might, a, it might be a bit higher than you think. We have a control, which is Simon and Schuster will have the TCM figures. So uh, they TCM, can look at TCM yeah, being to, total it? consumer market. Those are the figures that come from Nielsen. So they will be able to compare the two and we'll see if there is ah, much of a difference. Well, so. That's actually really interesting because you could then get almost like a like a blending or an average of those two. I'll tell you what though, this pinpoint, this puts you on a different level. I mean, <laughs> no, seriously, like what authors understand their readers now to the extent, even that that one server that you've done, um, what surprised you the most out of all of the things? Because that's the thing about service, isn't it? It's like you, you do the research and it usually kind of brings up some stuff. You think, wow, I, I had no idea or I thought it was completely the opposite. Was there anything that really jumped out for you? The thing that, because uh, everyone's getting um, very excited about TikTok. So I ask people, you know, social media. Yeah. So about 70% are using Facebook at least once a week. 60% are using Twitter. 55% are using Instagram. Now, how many do you think... Of my lot, are using oh, TikTok. <laughs> this is a really interesting question. I, my, what do you, did you get a demographic within? Yes, yeah, yeah, what, yeah. Okay, do you want to give me the demo? Can you give me the demographic? We're very not? middle aged. Okay, right. <laughs> I think. Okay, so I think I think it's low, but I think it's probably higher than you expected because oh, because <laughs> really, go on. Okay, I'm gonna have to go. I have a guess. Um. Oh God! I don't know. Ten percent. Oh, you're very close. Twelve percent. Twelve percent. Twelve percent on but TikTok. Still, that's that's actually like that's like well, that's one in. I mean, over one in ten. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. I didn't. I think it's. I think TikTok is maturing as a demographic. Obviously, it started as like you know. I think of it as teenagers. You know. Mm. Um, classic kind of like, you know, maybe in the even pre-teens, 12, 13, 14. Yeah, but I mean, book talk has become a huge hashtag, yes, hasn't it? I did. I'm, seeing- yeah, I'm annoyed because I shut down my account. Um, but you- <laughs> <laughs> but that they, they is very infrequent. But I, I was talking to, um, you remember when we spoke to uh, Martin Latham, the manager of Waterstones in Canterbury, and he was saying that it seems to be driving a lot of backlist sales. Book talk seems to be a lot of people's, because he was saying sales of Ulysses, James Joyce's Ulysses, went through the roof. Uh because yes. of TikTok, because were people are going, I've never heard of this book. It's extraordinary. I have to check it out, and mm. then you get it, and you discover it's completely unreadable. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, there's there's little things like that. So this, like I say, as as you're aware, 
all sorts of caveats coming with this, but I think it's it's better than, than guesswork. Well, and, and one of the things I did, I asked people for their favourite authors, and mm. no, again, no big surprises. The, the name that came up again and again and again, Terry Pratchett, was Lovely. was the biggest one there. Ben Aronovich uh, was in there as well, uh, and Queeve McDonald. Now, Queeve, friend of the podcast, member of the BXP group on online. Queeve has been great because he I know he's plugged me on his newsletter quite a few times. Ah, so that's yes. the Queeve effect uh, where, Queeve you know, you, you have someone with a, a terrific newsletter who gives mm. you a plug and you get, you know, uh, you get Slice. some of those readers cross over. So um, I love this. Yeah. I, I think I find this I find this all so fascinating. And actually on the on the TikTok side of things, I think what might be interesting to keep keep um a track on um is that my guess is Facebook's probably going to reduce over time. That's that's my guess. It'll only take one big one big blow up and everyone will be like, oh I'm leaving Facebook. Yeah. And it not not in the MySpace kind of collapse, no, but no, no, no. but I think I think TikTok is going to keep increasing. So it'd be interesting over time. I think maybe in a few years, I wonder if they might be equal and whether it's actually something that's very but, important. I mean, it is surprising so many people asked it on Facebook. Seventy percent. Well, that's 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 um that's because we we we're hard as human beings. Once we get stuck with something, it's hard to change. Yeah. It's going to take something catastrophic with Facebook, and, and I'm talking about um, them. The I'm site sure going down. <laughs> <laughs> the site, yeah. The site goes down for say five days, or it just starts to become really unreliable. Anything mm. like that, because that was really the death of MySpace, and I remember it well because I had two hundred thousand followers <laughs> on MySpace. Um, it, it it really Rome. You know, Rome isn't built in a day, but man, can it come down quickly? And something happened with Facebook recently, which is for the first ever time in its history, it announced in its most recent quarterly results, Mr. Stay, that they had the first decline in users since they mm. first started. Now that dropped their share price dropped twenty percent. I mean, that that is how big the market thinks about mm. these things. So everything has a life cycle. I always learned this in life. Everything, like even you know, even to Facebook one day, I mean, it won't be Facebook. They're already starting to do name changes. I think it'll probably change Better. its name. Yeah. But um, as an author, what does that mean? As an author, it means we. it's always good to look at what the rising the rising stocks are, like the new, mm. new cryptocurrencies that are on their way up, the TikToks of this world, the things that might be the Facebooks of the future. Because mm. as we know, as we discuss this many, many times, you get on a trend early, such as ebooks and Amazon. I mean, we talk to many authors. You get a huge advantage uh, yeah. longer term. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Um, but it's also about not putting all your eggs in one basket. I think there are too many people that are all that are just just on Facebook or even just on TikTok. Bad, bad thing. It's all, always yes. down to the email list. My, but anyway, we talk about this in the academy, and if you want to learn more about it, it we go deep into this kind of stuff. So uh, just just one thing as well, I did you to. To do the presentation, I took all because people put in their favorite authors, and there were hundreds of them. And I thought the best way to do it, I put it into a word cloud creator. Brilliant. You know, the word cloud, yeah, where the biggest those. thing yeah. is is biggest. Uh, and I, I just found the first sort of free one online. Now, the only thing, it, I think it had a, an AI issue because uh, more than one person put down Lee Child, which then became Lee Children. <laughs> <laughs> Weird. <laughs> was that one of your main words? <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was a tiny oh, was one. Good. But it's, it's, I've shared it on social media and people are going, who the hell's Lee Children? <laughs> <laughs> it's Lee Charles' many offspring, obviously. Exactly, yeah. yeah Brilliant yeah. stuff. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating. So, Mark, are you going to do this? Uh, is this going to become an annual I think survey? so. Yeah. yeah I think, I think so. taking a benchmark is really important as well, doing it at the same mm. time each year. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. this is this. I'm doing this a couple of months ahead of the new book, and I've sent it to my publisher, and they've gone great. This is really helpful for marketing and figuring out, you know, where to target advertising and stuff like that. So, you know, if you're an author who's thinking, oh gosh, my publisher doesn't do anything, if you enable them, if you give them the tools, they're much more likely to act on it. That's that's yeah. what I found. And also essential for indie authors as well, because they don't oh, even yeah, have yeah, yeah. any of that feedback or any of the marketing like, expertise of the major publisher. So question for everyone out there, have you done a survey? If you have, what did you learn and what surprised you? And the most important question, how did it help you? you know, if you did a survey a year ago, two years, how do you think that survey's helped you understand your audience and maybe led to some of the success that you have today? And if you haven't done a survey, are you feeling inspired by Mark's efforts to, to do your own? So get in contact, come over to 
the website, click on the contact us button, send us an email or all the usual suspects, except TikTok, Mark, because we're not on TikTok yet, are we? <laughs> he says. No. But Facebook, Instagram, <laughs> Twitter, Pinterest, all the others. Uh, do join us there and, the and just let us know. Give us your feedback. A um, bit of follow up, because you remember last week, Yes, you were, you were asking about books with uneven edges. I was. I found out what it's called. It's Ooh. it's called it's called deckled edging. Deckled edging. That sounds really it's a posh, lovely word. Isn't it? Yeah, D E C K L E D, and it, it's how books loose to used to look back in days of yore. So if oh. you see it these days, it's basically hipster publishing. They're trying to make it look more authentic. Air quotes. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, I just thought of a little bit of follow up. I know you asked, and I looked into it. Also, listeners as well. And um, we mentioned last week uh, Andrew Chapman, who was set out to write a bestseller in a day well he did it he didn't he didn't hit his word count because he finished it below word count and he even started redrafting it but he stayed up for over 24 hours he was number one in the hot new releases on amazon so he has done it the book's up for pre-order we've got a special episode with andrew we we thought we might tack it on the end of this but what started as a five minute conversation went on for over half an hour and it's really (laughs) fascinating so that's going to be a separate episode open to everyone that's coming out in fact it might already be out by the time this episode comes out so do do check that out so anyway just thought i'd get that any other business yeah. out of the way well um, and congratulations to andrew because i remember following him on you know during the day i sent him a message i think at about it was around midnight his time <laughs> just giving him the little push come on keep going but absolutely brilliant and what an amazing achievement i mean brilliant job andrew for like pre-releasing the book before he'd even written it love yeah. that i mean yeah. that in itself is a, a major question who's ever done that who's ever pre-released a book before they've written it but i and then getting it to i remember as it went up the charts it kind of it, it started getting wedged between two stephen king novels yeah. which was huge because that so was chuffed you yeah. know and then it went all the way to number one so i mean fantastic and brilliant and i'm glad that uh, it was such a great and i can't wait to hear the deep dive mark as well it's gonna be fan- fascinating it's good stuff excellent good stuff. so yes so mark, uh, tell us about this week's special guest louise hair louise hair well louise hair's debut this lovely city was featured on the inaugural bbc2 tv book club show between the covers it was shortlisted for the rsl on darchy prize it, louise was selected as uh, for the observer's top 10 best debut novelist in 2020 and now she's back with uh, a, a murder mystery miss aldridge regrets it's set aboard the queen mary in 1936 it combines music and glamour with themes of race and class and pre-world war ii politics so we discuss unreliable narrators how her novel started as a short story and the importance of finding your own writing community brilliant so let's dive in and listen to mark chatting with the lovely louise hare louise hare welcome to the bestseller experiment how are you today I am very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolute pleasure. You've got the cover for this book, Miss Aldridge Regrets. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's got this lovely 1930s glamour to it. Tell us all about Miss Aldridge Regrets. So it is a murder mystery set in 1936. Um, sort of inspired a bit by Agatha Christie, a bit by Patricia Highsmith. Um, my main character, Lena, is a jazz singer um, who sort of grew up having all these great ambitions that she was going to be a West End star and it sort of not um, not really worked out her way. Um, <laughs> and then one day she gets offered this sort of chance of a lifetime to go and perform on Broadway. Um, so the deal is they'll give her a first class ticket on Queen Mary. It sort of sounds too good to be true, like she does know that. Um, but then that night at the sort of less, you know, fancy club that she works at in Soho, there's a murder and it suddenly seems like a really good time to get out of London. (laughs) It's brilliant. Brilliant start. Uh, Agatha, you mentioned Agatha Christie there, and yes, the cover definitely evokes that kind of Agatha Christie vibe. Were you a big fan of Christie and Patricia Highsmith? Were they they authors that you, you grew up reading? Yeah, I read, um, Agatha Christie definitely when I was, um, younger my mum was a big fan so there were always sort of those books hanging around um and I love um <laughs> it's cheating because it's watching it on tv but I love David Suchet's Poirot like I could just you know a Sunday yeah. afternoon watching three or four of those back to back is is sort of perfect for me yeah yeah um yeah and then because this um so Miss Aldridge actually started off as a short story I was doing an MA in creative writing and wrote this sort of short story set in a in a jazz club uh, but the feedback was, well, we want to know what happens to her after this murder. Like, what, what's the rest of the story? 
Um, and at the time, as part of the course, we've been reading um, Patricia Highsmith, we've been reading the talents of Mr. Ripley. And I was just fascinated by the idea that you could write this character who's so such a wrong one, essentially, but you really root for him to get away with. Him. <laughs> you know, he's like, no, like no, but I really don't want the police to catch him. It's like I was sort of reading it going, why, why am I so supportive of his crimes? Um, so I wanted to write a flawed character. Um, I mean, she's not she's not as bad as Ripley, but um, you know, to be able to write a character who has all those flaws, but you you want to root for her. So that's kind of what I was trying to sort of marry up, I guess. That is, that is a real challenge, isn't it? Writing the anti-hero, the unreliable narrator, the the cad, uh, someone who does very terrible things, but you're still rooting for them. When you were studying talented Mr. Ripley and 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 indeed writing this book, what were the big lessons you learned? What are the big tips that you you you'd like you know to carry over? Um, I think I think character number one. I mean, it's you can come up with like a great plot, but I think if you don't have the characters that people want to stick with, it just becomes a little bit flat. Um, you know, when I think about Agatha Christie, I think about Prora, I think about Miss Mop, I think about the characters. For me personally, that those are the characters that that stick with me um above above the, I mean, obviously you need the great plot, but um I think that's what I was sort of trying to um emulate, I think. But then also just make it fun and just remember that um I'm not really a plotter. So sometimes things happen um in in writing this book, including changing the murder, because I've got to the end and realized that the person I thought did it didn't do it. <laughs> so <laughs> I just thought if you know if I'm having fun doing it and I want to know what happens, then hopefully the readers will too. Did you uh were you ever so did you ever get any feedback along the lines of can you make this character more relatable, make them, you know, not make them such a, uh, an, you know, so complex character? Or because it's common criticism, isn't it? If you write anyone who is a bit of a villain uh, as your protagonist, people will, will want you to make them more relatable. Is that ever anything you came up against? I think I just, I was, had that in the back of my head. So I think with Lena, um, She's not. She's not a bad person. I think hopefully she is relatable. Anyway, she makes silly mistakes. It's more that she makes. She's a bit foolish at times, rather than she's like a bad person. So you know, she drinks a lot. She smokes a lot. <laughs> she might take recreational drugs every now and again. But you know, she's sort of relatable. And you sort of um, can, I guess, kind of understand how she's got into the situation that she's in. I mean, there are some less nice characters in the book, but you are supposed to dislike them so um so yeah i think i've just managed to get away with it i think it's the flaws that make them interesting that make them relatable isn't it it's uh it's giving them just enough to make them human um exactly. that thing of changing to the end and changing who the murderer was we um we had Nina de Gramont on the uh, podcast a few weeks ago, and she wrote The Christie Affair, which is about Agatha Christie's disappearance. And during the conversation, uh, we, we learned that the author, Brian Aldiss, once spoke to Agatha Christie, and she said she got all the way to the last chapter, and only then did she decide who the murderer was. So were you kind of – how much of a shock was that for – how much of an upheaval was that for the next draft as well, having to go back and rejig everything in order to make them the murderer? I think, luckily, I mean, the reason it became obvious to me that it was someone else was because I'd sort of written it so that they actually had, they actually had a stronger motive, essentially. And then I was sort of thinking about who they were as a person. Um, and actually, I didn't need to change very much. I had to rewrite the ending, obviously, because the big reveal obviously doesn't work when it's a completely different person. <laughs> but um, yeah, actually, there wasn't that much rewriting, which is how I sort of knew it was the right decision, because I, I sort of felt like I'd already written it um, around that person accidentally. Right, so the character had developed as you were writing. The more you got to them, the more motivation you gave them to do to do the deed. Yeah, because I think that's sort of the beauty of the first draft. Like for me, I start off, and as I said, I don't really plan. I have like some vague plot points. Um, and again, the characters, as you know, apart from Lena, the rest of the characters were quite shadowy. And I got to know them as I was writing that first draft. Mm -hmm. So you know, once I got to the end, I was like, oh, I feel like I know these people now and I know actually the fair, the person that I thought had done it I actually don't think they would be capable of it I don't think they would um have it in them to to do you know to to kill this this many people because there are there are a few murders um so, <laughs> so yeah but I think mean, that is it's just something I I always just go the, the first just for me to find out what's going on 
And then it's the subsequent drafts where I actually think, okay, I know what this book is about. I know what what's going on. Brilliant. Now, you mentioned this started as a short story uh, mm-hmm. and people wanted to know more. Was there a part of you thought, but I've told the story in the short story, and and did you were you ever thinking, blimey, is there any more in this? How do I how do I tease this out into a novel? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I'd had it before. So my my debut novel was the same thing. It was on the same course the year before I'd written a short story, and they were like, but what happens next? So <laughs> I was a bit frustrated because I really wanted to write a good short story, but um, so essentially in the short story it was. Um, some scenes in, in the jazz club in Soho And then my character was leaving to get on a ship But I guess as soon as you put in Oh, she's got a ticket to travel to America Everyone's like, what's going to happen there? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> and I guess because I was such a fan of um, Similar novels, I love a murder mystery um, It was quite exciting to um, To sort of think about actually How do I then, you know Start off with this jazz club scene But then take it onto a ship And how how is it all going to be connected? So yeah, it was quite. It was really fun to write this book, actually. Fantastic. Now your debut, this lovely city, had this kind of post-war austerity feel to it, whereas this is 1936. There's a lot of glamour, you know, that Agatha Christie. It's a lot of it is set on the Queen Mary. Uh, tell us about that choice to sort of to, to shift to that sort of glamorous side of of the 30s. Yeah, I think it, it was. So when I started out, it was actually going to be set in 1950. So it was going to be very much the same time as this lovely city. Um, but then when I started thinking about it as a, as a longer novel, um, I mean, what attracted to me to writing about the Queen Mary and I guess going back to sort of the Agatha Christie things, you watch a David Sue show, Poirot, and it's so beautiful. And it, you know, it's just, I watch it for the fashion. It's like whatever all the women <laughs> are wearing. And I sort of thought, oh, it wouldn't be fun to just write something like that. Mm. Um with a few, you know, tweaks to to sort of fit maybe a, a more modern um, reader. So, yeah, I just sort of thought it was just really, I wanted to write something really fun. I found writing my debut really challenging mm-hmm. um, and quite, you know, there's, you know there's, as you said, it's sort of austerity Britain and um, lots of bad things happening to my characters um, in terms of sort of class and race and all that kind of thing. And I thought, you know, it'd be really nice to write something just really fun um page turny <laughs> yeah a bit of glamour like the research was really fun um just looking up all the different pictures of dresses and then because it's the queen mary you can find out so much information like i went to the british library and you can get the copies of the like the ship's paper that they used to oh. hand out every day um so they've got copies from 1936 and if you look at what the menus were um so and I love like food if, if I'm one of those people that if I'm going to when I go to a restaurant I go on look at the menu Every day leading up to it, just you know, make my menu choices. So you know, hours wasted choosing what Lena was going to eat every day. Oh, that's fantastic! That is wonderful. Was Was there anything on the menu that maybe we don't have now that you'd like to travel back in time and 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 have a nibble on? Uh, I mean, it was so extensive. There was lots of like feel and quail and you know, <laughs> fancy, very rich foods. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was quite, a, I guess it's kind of a standard menu. I was quite surprised at how, you know, you probably could go to like a fancy restaurant in London now and order like very similar. Um, but yeah, it's just like the choice, like the amount of choice that you had on the menu, even because they had different menus for first class and second class, but it, you know, quite similar because it was all coming out of the same kitchen. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it just felt like you could, if you had the money, you could get whatever you wanted, even though you were at sea. Wow different time um let's uh let's talk about your debut debut and leading up to your debut and where it all started because as i understand it your your dad has written hasn't he he's written novels mm, yeah and so he um self-published some right novels. um he's still yeah he's still sort of writing little bits and bobs now did that inspire you to, to start writing yourself or had you always written yeah, I used to, because he wrote when I was a kid um, as well, and he was trying to get traditionally published when I was a kid. So, um, and he wrote like kids' stories, so he'd read them to me, me and my brother. Um, and I used to write a lot as a kid. And then, I don't know, I sort of hit teenage years and found more exciting things to do uh, <laughs> with my free time. Um, and so I really got, sort of went back to writing about six, seven years ago. Um, mostly just because... I'd sort of hit this sort of mid-30s career crisis where I wasn't sure 
what my next steps were going to be. And I thought, you know, I just need a distraction. So I signed up for a writing course and actually just found that I really enjoyed it and sort of, it sort of kicked on um, from there. Yeah. Excellent. So you working in the travel industry, is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, I guess it was quite a good time on my debut novel because my old job doesn't exist anymore. Oh, thanks crikey. to COVID. Yeah, blimey. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, really good time. So um, when you did the course, and this was uh, an MA in creative writing from Birkbeck at the, the University of London, um, what were the big uh, lessons that you, you learned in that? It's because it's if, you, if you're sort of, um, if you hadn't written for a number of years, you've really got to hit the ground running when you're doing an MA, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, it was just so inspirational because I think because I chose to do it there because it's in the evening, you can do it around work. Um, right. Because otherwise, you know, I just can't, I can't afford to take a year off work. I'm yeah. not rich. Um, and it's already quite a pricey thing to do. Um, but I think because of that, you meet so many different people from all different walks of life. Everyone's doing it around work. People are juggling childcare and people are a little bit older than you get on some degrees, I think. Um, so that was really great to be able to share my work with, you know, lots of different people and, I guess learning to take criticism because that's always something that you can't really get away from if you're a writer. Like someone's always going to love your work. Someone's always going to hate your work. So sort of getting used to um, sort of that experience, but just getting to try lots of new things. So we did like short stories. I did a bit of playwriting. Um, We did um, a class on genre, which is when I wrote this, uh, a sort of a crime short story. Um, so yeah, it's just really exciting meeting lots of different people, like listen, you know, reading all their different work and sort of, I guess, learning, learning from them and trying to just become better and work out what, I guess, my weaknesses were and what my strengths were. So you can kind of, you know, lead into your strengths and then try and sort of fix your weaknesses a little bit. So yeah, I just, lo- I mean, I, I just loved it. And, I, you know, my first two published books are literally as a result of it. So um yeah it's definitely worthwhile <laughs> do you still that that sort of peer group that you were working with do you still keep in touch with them have you sort of created your own little writers community yeah definitely I mean we were before the before the pandemic we were sort of meeting a quite a big group of us up to 10 of us um and even now with all those sort of things that have been going on there's still uh like four of us that meet up once a month and sort of share work and and critique and just have a little catch up so um so yeah it's been it's been really good because I think you know it doesn't matter if you've got an editor it's always handy to just be able to write a little bit of something and go does this make sense does you know is this interesting you know without having to write you know chapters and chapters something to, to share with a busy agent and a busy editor you can just go oh can I just email you this thing and yeah you know tell me if it's rubbish <laughs> yeah no, it's so important. It really is so important. It's something that I was at the London Book Fair yesterday and we were talking to some published authors and some of them were saying that they they regret losing that uh, because you're right, the editors and, and agents are, you know, mega busy and can't always just turn turn around. And with that sort of, you know, that community that you have, there's a quid pro quo, you know, you, you read my stuff, I'll read your, your stuff and it's all, you know, and because they're your peers, there's a kind of honesty to it as well. There's a sort of, you know, uh, it, it's reliable feedback, and that's com- really invaluable, isn't it? Exactly. I mean, you can't pay for that because it takes time to get to know yeah. who gets your work as well. Because they're just we're all different, so there's all you know. It, it's just working out whose feedback is going to work. It's going to work for me because mm. not everyone's will. Yeah. You know, it, it, best of intentions. Yeah. Now you mentioned this course. You could um, work around the day job and stuff like that. We're always obsessed with with writing habits on the podcast and how people juggle lives and family and jobs. So um, your routine when you're working on the MA, you know, you're working around a job. You, we had lockdown. I know a lot of people found lockdown very difficult. They they kind of couldn't write or stop writing. What's what was your routine? sort of in the run-up to the debut novel and for the second novel, had it changed and evolved in any way? Yeah, definitely. So um, so while I was doing the MA and, you know, trying to finish um, this lovely city, uh, you know, I was working full-time. So it was, it was fine in the summer. I'm really not a morning person. Right. But um, I found that in the summer I can get up early. So I was sort of getting up an hour before I would need to normally and trying to write 
you know, set myself a word target for each week and, you know, try and try and hit it. Um, and then, you know, if I didn't hit it in that, that little period, I'd sort of transfer it to myself at work and then do a bit at lunch and then do a bit after. Um, and then coffee shops at the weekend. Right. You know, but, but absolutely go out of my dress, you know, just drink so much coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, weirdly, because because you have to, because I had to fit it in, it sort of worked. Like I knew what I knew what needed to happen. I had my word count. I was like, I cannot, like, cannot not you know, miss this, hitting this target each week. And I was quite disciplined at that. And then um, I've actually for a lot of writing with Soldier's Regrets, the first draft was similar because I was still working. It was, you know, it's the, you know, just the lead up to um, the first book coming out. Mm -hmm. Um, But then, yeah, the lockdown really, really messed things up um, because I probably had a couple of months where I didn't write anything Mm -hmm. at all. Um, And then I'm sort of still struggling a little bit, I think, because it's hard to find the discipline when you feel like you've got all the time in the world. Like I don't have this sort of office job with set hours that I need to do. So I'm doing some freelance stuff um, as well, like some editing and some sort of workshop coaching online. Um, but yeah, it, I'm trying to set myself de- like the target still and and just sort of sit that thing. I, I will sit down or I will go to, again, a coffee shop just to get out of the flat and have a change of scene. Yeah, but yeah it's been really difficult. It's it. You're not on your own. It's funny. We were talking to... An author I'm hoping to get on the podcast soon, Stacey Halls, who is saying kind of the same thing that, um, you know, she's a very social person, likes meeting people, uh, and lockdown was very difficult. And then, you know, the the job of a writer is very solitary as well, you know, in, in getting out and out and about. I did see somewhere that you you go for long walks along the Thames and that that inspires you and that helps solve story problems. Is that something you're still able to do? Yeah, um, again, I've fallen, I did it a lot through all the lockdowns because that was like my daily, daily walk. Um, but it, yeah, it's really useful. I think I think a lot of writers like, uh, you know, you go for the walk and because it's just something where you can kind of switch off. You can listen to some sort of quite chilled music and just sort of, yeah, it just sort of frees your mind up, I guess, to mm-hmm. not have to be thinking about anything. So yeah, sometimes I had like, you know, a few little revelations um of how like, I was going to go back and you know fix um a certain problem so yeah I probably just need to get back into it I mean I guess one of the hard things about coming out of lockdown is then you get there's so many distractions that are like oh you know do I want to go for a two-hour walk or should I you know I maybe I should just do this you know go to the supermarket or I you know I need to go and do this today I need to go to the post office and do you know it's really mundane tasks that sort of take over yeah, we were, we were talking about laundry, yes, and Millie Johnson was talking about the ironing. She gets stacks of ironing done when she's trying to solve story problems. <laughs> I can't <laughs> to that. <laughs> no, I'd rather do my walks. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're thinking of setting up our own sort of household appliance service, you know, so you can get <laughs> authors who are stuck doing your ironing for you. Um, <laughs> what What's coming next, Louise? Uh, is, is there that kind of glamorous murder mystery thing is it going to be more of that or are you going in a different direction what's what's coming up next so um so excitingly even though i originally planned the soldier's regrets to be standalone um i've actually got a us publisher for for it now uh, so cool. it comes out there in july um and they want it to be a series so i've just finished the first draft of what happens to Lena next? Um, Fantastic. Which is quite exciting because it is set in um, New York. So it basically continues exactly on from um, where Misogyny's Regrets finishes. Brilliant. Now, that's, that's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Because if you imagine the story as a, a, a one off, you think, okay, we've, we've told Lena's story. So you've now got to continue her story, which is kind of unexpected. What are the big challenges there? Was that, was that tricky or was it fun to sort of get back in her shoes? Yeah, a bit of both. It, I mean, I really enjoy writing her as a character, um, so that's great. I think what I'm still figuring out is how much, because I wanted it to be able to survive, obviously, as, as a book you could just pick up without having read the first one. So it's just working out the balance of how much you want to put in from the first one. But it's a different story, so it's it's more about, um, it's sort of, in terms of like a murder mystery, there is, you know, it starts with an incident and then it, we go back and see the lead up to that incident, essentially. Right. Um, yeah. So it's less it's less murdery than with Soldier's Regrets, where there are several murders. There is just sort of one incident in this one. So it's a lot about, 
I guess the community um, and also um, because we get a, a bit of insight into Lena's relationship with her father who'd recently died um, sort of just before Miss Aldridge regrets takes place so it's it's sort of her sort of delving into that as well because he she knows that he um, lived in New York so it's sort of her chance to sort of investigate um, what his story is as well as you know dealing with this other incident which I can't really say anything about no, because no I don't spoilers know. no spoilers or- <laughs> Although, when you when you go on to do something like this, are there things in book one that you think, oh, damn, I wish I could just go back and change that just to, you know, retcon what's happening in the next book? Or are you just using that as a jumping off point for the second book? Yeah, I think it's okay. I think it's okay. Um, because luckily I've been, I sort of started writing that while I was doing copy edits for Miss Aldrich Grass. So I could sort right. of keep both sort of fresh in my mind. So I knew you know, what I'd already written because that's huh. also like, I think a, a potential issue that you forget about something that happened oh, yeah. in the first book. Yeah. And then, um, <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think it's okay. Um, but yeah, I think because of the certain things that happen in the first book, I think potentially it's a trilogy. I mean, we'll have to see what happens. I've definitely got the contract for the second book, so that's fine. But yeah, I, I see it as hopefully a trilogy. And then I think her story would be like quite nicely told. Fantastic. Can't wait. Louise, thank you so much for that. Folks, Miss Aldridge Regrets is out there. Grab a copy right now. What are your writing dreams? Finishing that book, quitting the day job, becoming a best-selling author? Well, over four years, we've studied the advice of over 300 best-selling authors who've collectively sold over half a billion books. And we are excited to announce the Best Seller Academy, If you're ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft and coaching, your bestseller dreams are now only a click away. To find out more and apply, visit bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. That's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. Mark, I've got to say, I know we've talked about this a lot in the past about as you write your book, you get to know more and more about your characters. But I absolutely loved how Louise said, I got to know the character so well and realized they're just not capable of murder. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's not great, the kind of thing you expect, but it, what a brilliant example of that journey of having to kind of spend time with your character to really get to know them from the outset. Mm. I love it. Yeah. Well, that's, that's one of the joys of, um, of that kind of uh, writing into the dark of writing by the seat of your pants. There's there's a character in the thing I'm writing at the moment where I'm, I've just realised what sort of person they are, and I've made a little note and said, right, you're going to go back. I'm not going back now. I'm going to get to the end, but from this point forth, they're going to be this kind of person, and I'll go go back and seed that idea in, and that's the joy of it. You just discover these layers of these characters as as you as you go along, and just you know. It's that thing of how would they react if X happened, if Y happened or whatever. How how would they react in a way that's different to the way that everyone else in the story would react? And that's how you discover who your who your characters are. Because I know a lot of authors talk about, you know, before you start writing your book, you know, write a bit of the backstory of your characters, your main characters to get to know who they are. And I know that, you know, authors like Stephanie Mayer and Twilight, she would go into kind of writing character sheets and all the attributes. And there'd be like a, you get these lists online, they're great. You know, you can, you know, who's their favorite artist? What's their favorite meal? Just everyday things that start to paint a bit of a picture. But I think what you just said there is really interesting. It's it's when you put, you have to put them, you can learn as much as you want about them factually, but you have to put them in situations to learn how they react. And that's yeah. what happens when you start writing, right? Well, look, it's horses for courses. If, if doing that kind of fact sheet beforehand is what inspires you, then, then go for it. I used to do that, but I never found it terribly useful. I prefer getting, like, like actors rehearsing a play, I like to get them on their feet and improvise a bit. And sometimes mm. it just takes you maybe writing a scene that's not in the novel and just having a little short story or a one-page scene aside from the novel where you put them in the situation just to test them, just to see how, how they react. And, and and they might surprise you. They might, you know, do something that's completely out of the blue that you think, oh, 
oh, I can use that. I can see that in. I can, you know, it, it's got me out of a scrape. It's got me out of a corner. Um, so it's all it's always worth doing. I think just getting them on their feet and interacting with other people and putting them in tricky situations is is what storytelling is all about, really. Mm, absolutely. And Louise also mentioned about her experiences, you know, doing her MA and and breaking into groups and, and working with other writers. And this is something obviously it's you know huge obviously within the academy and we've seen the, the benefits of that. Um but it's it's a really I think it's a, a very missed and important valuable part of a writer's career. I mean you look at all the greats, you know, they would have all these writing groups like the Ink was it the Inklings? Mm. Um yeah, Tolkien, Tolkien and, and C.S. Lewis. Lewis. Yeah. C.S. Lewis and like and and there's something about balancing out that the isolation that you talked about you know people you know the writers the writer in their room sitting there with a you know with a quill trying to write their story but <laughs> having that group is absolutely i think it's an absolutely essential part of any writer um, and it's often missed out i think a lot of people don't have that support group it's it's really interesting that and today of all days we're um uh, there's been a series of pieces in the bookseller about burnout and mm. they they ran a poll a survey not so long ago, uh, sort of polling staff at publishers and uh, and agencies, and overall, sixty nine percent of staff claimed they were suffering from burnout. Sixty nine percent of staff. Now, wow. obviously, that's after a very tough couple of years with COVID, and you know, there's cost of living and what have you, and it's a very stressful time. And um, so they've run a series of pieces in the bookseller. What there was one from an editor the other day. There was one from an agent, and today there was a piece. Uh, from an author, Anna Vaught. And it's a long piece, and she's she's talking about mental health issues with writers, the fact that it is this solitary thing. But the, the gist of it was, a conclusion was, we are stronger together and don't be ashamed to ask for help. And I think this, I mean, this is what the Academy is built on. You know, there, there is no such thing as a stupid question. We have a community. We help each other, you know, th- ask for help. Ask, you know, people will step in. Uh, we see the same thing on the BXP group, on the Facebook group as well. That the people don't hesitate to step up and and console or cheer you on or help you out or offer some kind of, you know, some some words of help. So, you know, don't if you are feeling alone, if you're not finding that community, maybe it's time to start one. Maybe you you know start that community on Facebook or or start a writers group in your in your local bookshop or or come and join the academy come and join well, I was going to say yeah, there's, exactly. there's there's a there's a there's a, a lot of work involved in starting and running a community as well we know with the academy I mean oh, it's yeah. not it's it's a, there's, <laughs> it's a lot of work so what i would suggest to people is if you're thinking of getting involved in something that start by joining community first. I mean, and the Academy obviously is there for exactly that purpose. And obviously we're going to, you know, we're going to give it a plug on the show because we to- we're doing it because we totally believe in it, but we're also seeing the value of it. I mean, this is, this is, we're coming up to two years now of running it and, and we're seeing the value and, and the feedback from people about the importance of having like-minded individuals. And this is the other thing. It's not just about finding someone down the road that writes because they might, a lot of writers groups, um, especially local writers groups, I've heard, and not our one isn't like this, but I've heard that, you know, if you get kind of some, like in any group, it doesn't even matter if it's writing or a sports club for your kids or whatever, there's sometimes people in there who are very outspoken and want to control everything and 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 it can ruin the the spirit of what the group is for everyone else. And so it's important to, to find your people. And the thing about the academy that I love is because we, you know, that obviously a lot of people listen to the podcast, so they're 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 kind of attracted to the things that that the, the guests we get on and the spirit in which we do the podcast. It kind of carries into the academy, which is why we have a very like minded group of people in the academy who are all encouraging. In two years, we haven't had one. I don't think we've had one instance in any of the live coaching in any of the discussions on the forums and anything where somebody's like taken someone down or you know no. there's been an argument it's it's a beautiful spirit and i think you have to create that um from the outset which but is I what th- we always i intended. think that's that's the key difference between a local writers group and a course with a course there's a grown up in the room which apparently is me sometimes <laughs> um, <laughs> who yeah. you know 
keeps the class under control. But yeah. I've never had to do that. You know, I've, it's, it's brilliant. It's, isn't it's it? always been, you know. So amazing. yeah, find your people and and um, but if you don't have a group, it's incredibly powerful, especially during. I mean, not just the great times when you celebrate all the successes, that's incredible. Like, and, and we love to do that. But actually, it's during those hard times. And we have a lot of people in the academy who say, I've hit rock bottom. You know, I've I've stopped writing for a month or two and I'm back, you know, and it's, but I'm back because I've I'm, I've got something to come back to. And, um, but just an example, this this week about the power of groups, uh, Sandra, one of our academates, dropped us a, a, a win. Um, and talking about how she is now writing a story with a group of people. And she's actually put it out to the Academy members to say, um, does anyone want to, to write? Does anyone want to write with me? Do you, should, we, should we do something together? And it's those kind of collaborations that can come from these groups as well, which people often don't realise. I've got that in social media at the I, end. I thought you probably did. Spoiler. But I thought it was very, <laughs> spoiler alert. But I think it's very relevant, isn't it? Because, yeah, it you is, know, it is totally, it's, yeah. really, it's really interesting um, what's going on. There's so many more things that come out of being part of a group than just being with a group of social lovely writers and getting great feedback and encouragement. Mm. There's other knock-on effects that may be career-changing for some people. So, mm. excellent. Mm. Now, Mark, um, Louise said that she's not a morning person. Are you a morning person? I am, yes. I have you always been? My... Have you always been a morning person? Uh, no, actually, as a teenager, <laughs> very happy to sleep in till noon, and I, I'm glad to see my son is taking on that tradition. Absolutely, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can vouch for that as well. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because when mm. Louise said about being a morning person, there's always part of my my the inner coach in me goes, ooh. You're labelling yourself as a morning person and that means you're always, you know, as a, not a morning person and, and you're going to then struggle. And I sometimes, and I know we've had these discussions before about writing first thing, writing in the morning, banking your words before mm. midday if you can. And a lot of people say, yeah, but I'm not a morning person. But the inner coach of me always says that that's a, that's a potentially a label that you're giving yourself a story to yourself and maybe a habit that's formed over a number of years but I believe everything is changeable. Um, I don't know how you what you feel about that because you've you've been forced into being a morning person, obviously, when you went to work. Commuting. Well, I, do, I, I think you change and mature. I mean, there's some. Um, it's it's well documented that children, for example, don't really function till about ten o'clock. You're right. Yet, it's circadian yet, rhythms all over yeah, the place. Exactly, when you come and yet teens, we, yeah. you know, we insist on sending them to school at the crack of dawn. You know, yeah, and they're bleary until the middle of the day, and then we wonder why they're, you know, they're desperately unhappy. Uh, so, but I think once you get to an age, once you get to adulthood, and you can, um, you, if you have some kind of, if you are the kind of person who needs to write around family or a job, or you know, might be a carer or whatever, if you're trying to find that time, then you need to adjust accordingly don't you you need to mm. start rethinking that that habit and how you might do it and yeah i th once i started writing on trains in the morning i kind of um i enjoyed it and now that's kind of where i am and i i am a morning person and, mm. and you know by the evening i'm wiped <laughs> yeah well here's here's something interesting as well i think we all have noticed that as we get older we typically get up a bit earlier. I mean, I remember my grandparents would be like asleep yes. by, you know, they'd be in bed at nine and they'd be up at like five. And I'm like, what? That's me. <laughs> right? <laughs> and I think, and there's also now a whole movement. A lot of people listening to this podcast will probably know of it and even being a part of it, the 5 a.m. club, which yes. is this idea of, you know, getting all your work done early and there's loads of benefits. I will say though, I was interviewing a sleep specialist the other day. Very fascinating. And she said, and I'm giving this information out there for everyone to think about, because if people, are, if you have, if you've got a bad sleep routine, okay, it's not about how much you sleep. It's about the routine of sleep. If you're going to bed one night at 11, another night at one, another night at 12, mm. some, then you're crashing at 10. That is the massivest, if that's a word, part of the problem. It's, it's the <laughs> it's lack the of, <laughs> it's the lack of routine is now lack of routine. And, but she said, the other thing is a lot of people always focus on when they've got a sleep challenge, they're always focusing on the time they get to bed. She said, you have to start with the time you get up and you have to start with oh. making, which is interesting because it's the reverse of what everyone thinks. Mm. So if you're having sleep, yeah. if you want to get a sleep routine in place, you have to actually focus on getting up at a certain time, regardless of how tired you are, you start getting up. And then that works in reverse and fixes the problem of when you go to bed because you then get tired at the same time every night because you're getting up at the same time every morning. 
very, very interesting. And actually sleep is something I've talked about in some podcasts before I did. A, I did a year long study on my own sleep. I have noticed such a massive difference, massive difference for the first time in my life by actually being pretty strict with the, with the routine as to when I go to bed. I used to be a after midnight, you know, uh, I, and it was, sometimes it was one, sometimes it was 11. I was all over the place. Soon as I, as soon as I actually managed to start nailing it and started getting really disciplined with myself and getting that, the body just responds. It loves clockwork. Mm. It absolutely loves clockwork. And then you get through the whole day, you know, you feel, you feel good at the end of the day. And yeah, you feel very tired when you hit that time at night, but. Well, it's, it's, it's one of those things you're told as a parent, aren't you? And it does work is, is oh, routine huge. with kids, I know. you huge. know, which is why when you break out of the routine, maybe go on holiday or something like that, that it, it all goes to hell. But the yeah. routine is everything. And of course, sleep. Before electricity came along, we used to sleep in two shifts. Yeah. You know, we used to sleep. We'd, we'd get up at four in the morning or whatever for a couple of hours, you know, have some ablutions, maybe have have a snack and then go back to sleep again, have a second shift, which mm. there are times when I've done that. It's great because if you, if you wake up with insomnia at four in the morning, I'm like, oh, well, I'm going to get up. I'm going to get up and do something and write and maybe write for half an hour and then go back to sleep. And the sleep, the second sleep, oh, it's blissful. It's a lovely deep sleep. It's it's terrific mm. stuff. Yeah. There's so anyway. much we don't understand about <laughs> sleep, which we're still discovering. And there's been a lot of a lot of breakthroughs in the last even 10, 15 years. But um I think it's very important for writers to pay attention to that. You know, writing is not like we always say it's not just about the craft stuff. It's about it's about like if you were an athlete, if you were running for the Olympics, um, you would be paying attention to your nutrition, your sleep, how long you're sitting on your bum, how often you get out and move around, all of the important things, your mental health. Um, and I think as writers, if you want to be an Olympic writer, then you should definitely be paying attention to all of those facets because they're all going to help. It's interesting you say that. I talk about that with Andrew Chapman on his mm. writer bestseller in, in a day. Ah. He he paid great attention to his mental health, his diet, his you know getting up and moving about, his chair. Uh, it's it's some it, it's almost like he's condensed the writer's life into twenty four hours, and it's yeah. it's interesting that he paid real attention to that, and that's one of the things that kept him going. And anyone who's ever done NaNoWriMo, who's just gone for it in the month of November, will know that there are knock on effects, there are side effects, unwanted side effects of of doing something that intense in that period of time when you don't do that every month. I mean, yeah, if you want to write 50,000 words every month, we know there are authors that do that. It's part of their routine and they're like, yeah, I polish off 2,000 words a day. But for people that are kind of like suddenly jumping into that, their whole life, you know, relationships, sleep, stress, everything kind of goes out of whack and it, and it has a it can have a serious, you know, knock-on effect. So very fascinating. We will delve more into this we're going to do more of this actually in, in the academy because health and well-being is a big part of what we we coach on all this great stuff that we don't often talk about um as writers but is absolutely essential absolutely essential um what about the the discipline mark because louise said that she finds it hard and actually said a great quote didn't she Yes, the quote is it's hard to find the discipline when you've got all the time in the world and it's it's brilliant. It's that thing of giving uh, giving yourself limitations. You know, I think really really helps. And if if you do, I've had this a bit uh, recently because um, I I think it was post COVID. I was you know like a lot of people. You 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 have COVID. You're knackered. You're you know. I don't think I've got long COVID or anything as bad as that. But I was only able to do one sort of writing shift and it was generally like an hour and it was tiring. And it's only now in May, and I got COVID at, at the end of October, I'm actually doing two shifts now. So I'm doing my morning bit and I'm doing my mid-morning bit and then I've got admin and stuff in the afternoon. So, so it's only now I feel like I've got my energy left. But it's um, I, I kind of felt, yeah, I, I'll do my morning shift, but then that's it, you know, I'm knackered and blah, blah, blah. And um, if you have... Tuesday was an interesting day. Yesterday was an interesting day because I didn't have any podcast stuff. I didn't have any interviews. I didn't have anything to do except write. Hmm. And, you know, and I had a good writing day in the end, but there's that little devil on your shoulder going, Netflix, Disney Plus. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
course. Um, you know, and YouTube. I resisted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, and I resisted. And I kept my head down. Good but for you. Yeah, I think she, Louise, is absolutely right. It's it's the writer's number one enemy. Well, it's procrastination as well, isn't it? It's well, it's and it well, it's, and the opposite of procrastination is 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 building discipline. And again, do this in the in the academy, but it's about creating rules for yourself. Uh, rules to live by and we talk about that because i think it's a very important once you start to actually make your own rules and stick to them then you know you start to get that accountability within yourself and it's uh yeah it's very very important but fascinating because you're right you, you i mean what do they say work expands to fill the time available mm. so if you if you are retired i mean anyone who's retired listening to the podcast right now will absolutely agree with this if you're retired and you've literally got you you could just write all year have you written your book have you even started it maybe not because you're retired and you've, you you can get up a bit you know you can take have a nice easy you know um roll into the morning read the paper volunteer in the community go out for coffee with your friends because you can and you deserve it because you've you know you've worked hard all your life and god damn it you should enjoy your retirement but i hear this over and over and we have folks that are retired in the academy it's some it's it, it's very hard sometimes when they that when they want to write their book because they literally have all their free time available do you, do you know the first thing my dad did when he retired what was that he got another job yeah, <laughs> my dad did as well. My dad yeah, but- did as well. My dad retired and then became a private tutor in in maths and physics because he dad- missed it so much and he needed something to fill his time. He had about a month and he said, I, "He said I've got to do something, Mark." He said, "I can't sit on my ass all day." What? Funnily enough, watching Poirot, watching you know, Louise just talked about Poirot <laughs> and David Suchet. Yeah. He said, "Yeah, I can't do that all day." So he had to go out and get. It's only recently, and he's in his you know in his seventies now. That he's taking it a bit easier, but yeah, it's. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to put this out there. I'm going to put this out there. I think retirement's a myth. I think we all need to stop thinking of retirement as this magic sixty whatever it is now, sixty five, sixty seven, sixty nine. It's going to keep going up whilst they kind of postpone paying people benefits, right? Yeah. But the point is, retirement is a myth because what we should all be aiming for is finding something that we love that we want to do for the rest of our life because it doesn't feel like work. If you have that guilt feeling of thinking, oh, I'm having too much fun here and earning money from it, why wouldn't we do that in our 70s, in our 80s? Writing books is a great example. You don't have to you don't stop writing just because you reach a certain age. It's like if it earns and if it can supplement your income or earn your income, then even better. I mean, isn't that what for a lot of people that glorious first phase of lockdown well unless you were a nurse or a frontline worker or doing terrible things you know or having to confront terrible things in hospitals or what have you but for the rest of us people who have office jobs people who were told to stay at home and lock down and not go in here wasn't that a glimpse of retirement for a lot of people it, it was for, for a short while you had the ability to do whatever you wanted to do and people they would bake they would cook. They would learn to play an spend instrument. Spend time with their novel, families. Spend time yeah. with their family. Oh, yeah. That's somewhere far further down this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> At know. least for the first month, and then it was like how to avoid so, everyone, barricade you know, we, yourself. We all got a glimpse of a little utopia there. So I think that's yeah. what uh, I think. You're absolutely right. It's um, yeah. Except of course, at the beginning of COVID, there was this other part of COVID, which was COVID, and everyone was yeah, freaking yeah, yeah, out, yeah. stressing out, and worrying. So yeah. a retirement in my view, is this beautiful, gentle movement into Lockdown a without the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> lock, lock, yeah, locked, yeah, exactly. Because, you, yeah, and people say they don't go out as much as they used to yeah, because, yeah. because they're not going to work. But it's a very important thing. So the, the, big, the big learning that I've had, and I've been studying this for a number of years, is change the word retirement to financial independence. I want to reach financial independence. Because once you reach financial independence, it means that you no longer have to work in order to pay your expenses. But you reach this kind of point where you generate enough income to put into savings and investments, and that that money generates exactly what you need on average per month. And at that point, you've then got the choice to just keep doing what you love. And if it keeps generating income, great. But if you don't want to do something that generates income, you can actually write a book, for example, which doesn't generate income whilst you're writing it, unless you've got an upfront deal. But for most authors, it's like a it's a it's a loss leader in some ways, isn't it? You're kind of writing upfront. 
This is why we need universal basic income, people. Look, the, the economy is tanking right now. UBI. It's time to jettison that yeah. universal basic income. In fact, on that on that note, I have a, I'll have to get it. One of my friends has set up a UBI YouTube channel, and I'll have to give him a shout shout out. But I'll, I'll dig out the URL for that. It's a whole I'll other. Put a link. Very Probably interesting. The show notes. Oh, it's the way forward. We, we could, we could, we could get into some very interesting conversations about this. I am fascinated by all of this, all of this. But yeah, if um, uh, yeah, what do you, what do you think about retirement, folks? If you do, you do you live by that idea that you you're right, you know, you're doing your job and you're going to become a writer when you get to sixty five because you'll have the time, or do you see retirement differently? Do you see retirement as um, or do you, like me, do you think of it as you don't use that word and, and define your life by retiring? Um, because like you say, I, I'd, I'd like to be writing music, writing words, um, you know, c- coaching, teaching for the rest of my life. I, I, I don't think I'll ever want to stop because I love it. No. And um, yeah. it's something that um, we think we have to finish when we reach a certain age that we're no longer of any use to anyone when we get the carriage clock. You know what I mean? It's like we need to change the way we think about retirement, but uh, fascinating stuff. Mr. Stay, we have a ton of social media this week. Oh, my gosh, do we? Do we? Um, Yes, so where do I start? Well, let's start with Sandra. You mentioned Sandra, who's in the Academy. And, you know, we ask people to post their wins on the Academy, and she says, is an insight a win. She's in the midst of struggling with her second book in a trilogy, and we had a um, we have a writer's surgery in the academy every every week, every Wednesday night. So I've got one tonight, and we were talking about this last week, the second book in the series, the pros and cons of writing that. Um, so, but she said at an April writers' retreat, her local groups group started flushing out a fun idea for a novella. Each takes a turn at writing a chapter, which has to be completed and sent out to the others within the week. So they have a Zoom meeting on Monday to go over the plot script meeting. Then she's got uh, she's got her chapter done in two days, two two thousand six hundred words, and she had great fun doing it. And she said, "This reassured me that I can still get on a roll." And the beauty of this project is I'm only responsible for developing one chapter. Then it moves into the hands of the next author in the group. Now, what she's described there is is how a lot of writers' rooms work in TV. Uh, you have a showrunner who says, right, you're writing episode one, you're writing episode two, I'll do episode three, blah, blah, blah. And you you have big story conversations about where the story goes. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, you say, okay, Sandra, you're going to write episode two. This, this, and this needs to happen. Go for it. And I think it's brilliant. It's a great insight. And it, I think it's a, a terrific way to, to as, as Sandra says, you know, if she's rediscovered her mojo, you know, she's, she's, she's been inspired and fired up for it. So uh, I think it's great, great fun. That's brilliant. And yeah, from that, she's, she's now prompting that idea within the Academy as well and looking for other people who want to write with her. So absolutely brilliant idea and congratulations. Can't wait to hear how that book turns out as well, because I think it could be fascinating experience for everyone. And uh, yeah, big shout out to the WIP writing group. So lots of people, uh, on social media and in the BXP group on Facebook, they're finishing stuff. So Andrew, Ch- I've got, I've got a name check Andrew again. He said, uh, because every Sunday we put a thing out saying, okay, what did you do this week? How did your week go? And he came and said, oh, I, I wrote 26,000 words, got a bestseller flag and ate a caterpillar. <laughs> because he celebrated with a, uh, a fake Colin the Caterpillar cake. So, Andrew, congratulations on that. More on Andrew on our standalone episode. Um, Tracy Montague, uh, she said, finished my novel edit, I think, ready to submit to agents and competitions, made a website, wrote a new synopsis and a query letter. And here we go. Made an oath never to stay up all night writing an entire novel. I think that's a very wise move, Tracy. Excellent. Very good. I'm very good. And I've had the privilege of reading Tracy's work and it's absolutely terrific. Um, Robin Sarti. She's, Robin says, I've got my April project done and wrapped up in a shiny bone sent off. Typed up all my notes for my editor for book three so we can chat about what we think the story needs. I've forgotten about an entire subplot. I've done that too, Robin. Don't worry. I had to leave myself a note the other day um, I, I remembered it, you know, just as I was going to sleep, had to write it down on a, in an email and send it to myself. So <laughs> I know exactly how that goes. Um, I love it. S- Steve Gowland, uh, Steve Gowland, he's written the end on book four of his uh, series, The Soul's Abyss, The Midnight Warriors, 82,000 words in 10 weeks. That is fantastic Whoa, going, Steve. Good going, Absolutely Steve. brilliant. Yeah, really, really good. Amazing. Really, really good work. So congrats on that. Um, had a lovely note from uh, Liz uh, Nosnefetz, uh, who's in the Academy and in the bestseller group uh, on Facebook. Liz says, uh, he says, out of curiosity, 
and maybe to see if there was someone I need to beat. What speed do you listen to the podcast at? I'm listening, <laughs> right, listening to the newest episode and wondering why the mark sounded so drained and exhausted. Then realised my app had knocked me back down to normal speed when I'm used to listening at 1.5 speed. What, we drain, sound drained drain. and exhausted at one. That's yeah. that's the normal speed. I, I, oh, I, we I, need I, to I, put more energy into it, Mark, obviously. I said to Liz, drained and exhausted. You can put that on my gravestone. Uh, but yes, <laughs> so what we need to do is slow down so that we sound normal to this and then suddenly speed up and really freak them out. <laughs> we could completely mess. <laughs> we could completely mess with... Because I think you can go up to two times, can't you? Is two it times two speed, yes. Most? Yeah. <gasps> yeah. Goes I listen, now, so. Okay, so I listen to podcasts at one and a quarter. I found that... <laughs> That gives me enough energy. I know. Just it's just my sweet spot. But it it does. It depends. On, it depends on whoever's speaking, right? It depends if they if they if they're very if they tend to be very slow. And I mean, I I think we I think we have a bit of energy in the podcast at one times. Mark, do you think? Well, I Would mean, it's what if if like Liz, you're used to listening to us sounding like the chipmunks. I guess then, then yes. Then I guess when you switch back, it's like what's gone wrong? It's like walking through tree. I'm gonna so, have. Do you know what I'm gonna have to do now? I'm gonna have to go away and listen to us speaking at one and a half just to see how ridiculous <laughs> we sound. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, keep uh, sending in your favourite bookshops as well, folks. Uh, we've been de properly deluged. I've had to put an extra tab on the spreadsheet that I use for social media just to put all the bookshops. So we, uh, we've got loads, but keep them coming. So if, we, if you don't hear yours this week, it'll be coming in uh, in another couple of weeks. So we had um, we had a, a, um, a message from Morgan Delaney, who uh, is in Berlin. And Morgan said, Otherland in Kreuzberg is Berlin's best bookshop for anyone looking for fantasy, science fiction or horror books, either in English or German. And just to prove that this is the best bookshop in all of Germany, he sent me a picture of the German edition of The Crow Folk, uh, face at Ravensauber, uh, face out in, uh, in this very bookshop. Um, I love it. Morgan also says St. George's Bookshop in Prenzlauer Berg is best for all other English language books. So we'll put we'll put links to those in the show notes. I love this. Thank you very much for that. And I also want to make sure that we get representation from some of the uh, far flung places in the world. Um, you know, Eastern Europe would be great. Uh, at Scandinavia with some of the hardest pronouncing words because I want to hear Mark go for these words. These are brilliant, <laughs> absolutely brilliant. So we've got to get you warmed up with a bit of German there, Mark. Ah, but yeah, Kreisberg, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Robin Sarty again uh, drops slide. Uh, La Have River Books is a ten minute drive down the river from our house. It's located on the wharf side of a gorgeous old building on the river. The roadside is occupied by a bakery with the most delicious sandwiches. The building used to be the La, ha La Have Outfitting Company. Company. I can't even say English words, so I've got no chance for foreign <laughs> language. And the space for the books all belonged to a master shipwright, and she gave us a picture, and it just looks like the kind of place you just want to curl up with a good book. So thank you so much for that, Robin. And from uh, my friend Kit Cox, and who's been a, a guest on the podcast as well, fantastic writer Kit. Kit mentions Baggins Book Bazaar in Rochester High Street, a secondhand bookshop, a maze of shelves, annuals from my youth, science fiction books with covers not safe for work, and antique books that look and feel like treasure. It was a book from here that inspired my first book too. And I know that bookshop in Rochester, it is it's it's like a magical bookshop. It's just wonderful from floor to ceiling with books, and it is enormous as well. So that's Baggins in Rochester. Thank you, everyone, for those. There'll be more of those next week. Brilliant. I think with a name like Baggins, it deserves to yeah. to, to win Bookshop of the Week potentially. But uh, <laughs> but here's here's a thought, Mark. As we start to build up all these brilliant bookshops, um, maybe when people do world like round the world backpacking trips, they can actually make those bookshops places that they can stop off. That could be an interesting uh, Ooh, adventure. That's a good idea. Yeah, 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 bookshop tour. Love it. But th thank you to everyone. And and the rule is, if you recommend the bookshop and they get a mention, you have to give them a call and let them know and get them to listen to the episode <laughs> because they'll love to hear their name. How often does a bookshop get a get a, uh, an international plug on a, a big podcast? Probably rarely. So 
tell tell everyone or if you've heard of them and you go if you go and visit them because you hear them on the podcast make sure you let the the yeah. proprietor know. know that that you heard you heard it because they talked about a bestseller experiment so they can go and have a listen and, and tell all their friends which would be absolutely fantastic to help their business as well because we want to support bookshops as yeah. much as we want to support writers as well because the two are absolutely connected obviously oh yeah mr stay um i hope you have a good week anything exciting coming up this week for you uh no <laughs> that's <laughs> nice just, actually it's well, quite I'm, nice just to have a calm a calm yeah, it is week. Th- this week is a really quiet week and Lovely. i've got i mean i'm just writing right i'm i'm working on three projects at once uh so it's um yeah it's crazy uh, juggling uh, but i'm not complaining i will never complain no. about that because i you know i'm living the dream i'm living yeah. my retirement you know <laughs> so it is so, great yeah. problem to have as we say yeah, i think not it's complaining well. definitely not complaining Whatever you're doing this week, folks, may it be a, an amazing week. May you even possibly have your best writing week ever. Who knows? Maybe that could be your intention for the next seven days. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for listening in. Again, thank you for supporting us. If you'd like to join Mark and I in the Academy, please drop along to academy.bestsellerexperiment.com. And if you would like to do the 200-word challenge, if you're new to this podcast, you might be thinking, what on earth is that? Well, 200 words a day. It's a challenge that we set. Uh, Come and join us. It's very simply just go to 200wordchallenge.com and get the writing habit of a lifetime. And if you want to drop us a line on social media, uh, Facebook is Bestseller Experiment. Twitter and Instagram is at Bestseller XP. Or just pop over to bestsellerexperiment.com. There's a contact tab there and you can drop us a line. And please subscribe, rate, review on your podcast uh, catcher of choice. Every one of those star ratings helps us get to more writers like you. And don't forget, if you'd like to get our free Vault of Gold, which gives you transcripts from the first season of this podcast, absolutely brilliant. It is a Vault of Gold, hence Mm. the title. All you need to do is pop along to our mailing list newsletter. Go to the website, bestsellerexperiment.com, click on newsletter, fill out your email address. And as a bonus, you'll also get a weekly email telling you everything about the most recent episode and what you'll learn from it. So um, pop along to the website today to do that. So Mr. Say, have a great week, sir been an absolute too. pleasure as always mm, and it's indeed. a goodbye from mark one and a goodbye from mark two Ta-da. goodbye <laughs>